I'm Vincent Price. Come closer. You'll be just as safe in this house of fear as any of the other five victims murdered by the bat. The bat is waiting for you. In all of the annals of mystery, there's never been a more elusive, fearsome. Hello and welcome to episode 630, is it me, I? Yeah, 639 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. This is Monster Kid Radio and I am your host, writer, and producer, Derek M. Cook. Thanks for being here. Thanks for downloading and checking out the show. Not sure how you listen to the show, whether it's on YouTube or some other podcatcher, but however it is, please give us a review or a like or a thumbs up or a star or Whatever it is that they do to show that you appreciate what we do here because we appreciate you listening to the podcast. And this week I've got a fun conversation with somebody who's never been on the show before. Technically. Okay. Technically, he has been on the show, actually, if I think about it. Because he was on last week's episode because his music was on the show. We're going to be talking with Chris Alexander. He is from the band Frankie's Chop Shop, as well as a number of other music projects and we played his music last week and we're playing music again this week from frankie's chop chop you're actually hearing it right now it's called the bat it appears on their self-titled album frankie's chop chop which you can find at frankie's chop shop.bandcamp.com and that's frankie's spelled f-r-a-n-k-y-s and then chop shop.bandcamp.com or follow the link in the show notes to check out the entire album and pick it up for yourself when you're done listening to this episode of the podcast chris reached out to me after i reached out to him this is how I find music to play on the show, folks. I'll go on to websites. Specifically, I go to Bandcamp because I found so much great music that way. And I'll just look up instrumental surf, horror surf, spooky surf, surf instrumental, rock surf, and try to find music that scratches that poor itch. And I found so much great stuff this way. And I found Frankie's Chop Shop this way. I reached out to him and he said he was a listener of the show. And he was happy to come on to the show to talk about this week's topic. I was thrilled. You know, I know that at one point we did have the Greasy Gills on the show, but it wasn't something that I did. That was the segment sent in by Brett Stillow, and I appreciate that. It was super cool. I love the Greasy Gills. This is the first time we've had a feature conversation with one of the musicians whose music is opening and closing the show. It's just, it's fun. And I got to talk to somebody about some surf music, even though I know absolutely nothing about how to create said surf music. He was very patient with me. And then we talked about Basil Gogos. He wanted to talk about Basil Gogos, the man behind so many iconic covers of famous monsters of Filmland. And you know, Kenny's not going to let that go by without talking about it on his installment of Kenny's look at famous monsters of Filmland coming up later on in this episode. That's all going to happen, of course. After you hear Mark Matsky's Beta Capsule Review, and he's continuing his conversation, his look, his journey through the return of Ultraman. You know, we've got a fun episode lined up. You're going to hear the bat at the end of the show, so I'm going to give Frankie's Chop Shop a break. We're going to get on to the rest of the show right now. Time for Halloween, October 13th through the 15th. Torch Song Entertainment presents Sinister Songs and Terrifying Tales. Starring Morticia, Gomez, and the rest of the Adams family. 
<laughs> Join Morticia and Gomez Adams and the rest of the family as they present an elegant evening of macabre tales of suspense and horror coupled with haunting tunes. Our devious duo will both terrify and seduce you with songs and stories as you enjoy specialty cocktails, appetizers, charcuterie, and desserts in an interactive cabaret-style setting. From classic creepy to kooky spooky and tongue-in-cheek, the Adams pair together tales and tunes that will usher in surprises around every dark corner. Ghoulies and ghosties lurk about pantomiming stories by classic horror writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Washington Irving, as well as a local Portland area writer. Recommended for ages 12 and up, that's Sinister Songs and Terrifying Tales, October 13th, 14th, and 15th at Samaritan Odd Fellows Lodge in downtown Milwaukee. For more information and tickets, visit www.torchsongentertainment.com. One never knows what lurks in the chamber of horrors. The beast loomed over her. It grinned down at Nina, fangs dripping clouds of hot breath billowing white in the moonlight. Its eyes blazed bright red. Nina felt the heat of the thing's body burning into her. Its reek like decaying meat made her wretch. She wanted to get to her feet, wanted to run, but fear held her tight in its grip. She gazed up at the monster, paralyzed. A low growl like the purr of a hungry cat emanated from the creature's massive throat. To Nina, the werewolf almost seemed to be smiling. She screamed. Opal Cushing, London, England, that same night. Opal Celine Cushing sat bolt upright in bed, screaming. Her eyes shot wide, her heart pounded in terror. Sweat poured down her 18-year-old body. She looked around, frantic. Her sister, who shared the same bed, appeared beside her in an instant. What is it? Topaz asked. Opal, what's wrong? He killed me, Opal wailed. He killed me, I'm dead! Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors, a classic monster alley novel by Stephen D. Sullivan. Available now to Amazon and other fine retailers. Coming soon in audiobook. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Return of Ultraman, Episode 32, Decisive Battle Under the Setting Sun, original air date, November 12th, 1971. Intense seismic activity causes Captain Ibuki to send members of Monster Attack Team out into the countryside to investigate. Concerned about upsetting the rural populace, the captain orders them to wear disguises while gathering their intel. Sporting a alpine mountaineering outfit, Go quickly gets to know a miner who's also the adoptive father of a problem child in the village. It turns out a monster was responsible for the cave-in that killed the boy's biological father. And that same monster is the source of increasingly strong earthquakes. Go sets out to explore the monster's lair, but the activity of the rousing kaiju traps him under ice and rock, rendering him unconscious. The snail-like monster emerges from its resting place, and while M.A.T. is ready for battle, Nothing could prepare them for the offensive weapon King Mai Mai unleashes, leaving the troubled youth Taro as their last best hope. To say episode 32 is unusual is an exercise in understatement. It is self-consciously bizarre in a variety of ways, and the result is fascinating and bewildering in a what-did-I-just-watch sort of way. Avant-garde camera work is employed throughout, as is broad comedy and the fantasy elements of the story blend with these 
to create the impression of having a weird dream about Ultraman, a sensation that reaches its climax when protein monster King Mai Mai starts dropping fart bombs on MAT. Yes, you heard me right. Thanks to this episode, fart bombs are canon in the Ultraman universe. After that sequence, the decisive battle under the setting sun of the title is a bit of an afterthought. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. Bigfoot is more than a legend. Something that walks upright like man is stalking our forests. Something is leaving huge, unexplainable footprints all over the face of our earth. The legend of McCullough's Mountain, filmed in color where it happened. The legend of McCullough's Mountain. They swear to God it's true. Rated G. Hello, we're the Greasy Gills, and you're listening to Monster Kid Radio. Don't take her! Madeline! No! Let me go! (laughs) Only the incomparable genius of Edgar Allan Poe could knit them so closely together. The burning passions of the purest of loves. The deadly passions of the madly prurient. Madeline, you're leaving this house with me tomorrow. Only I could. For hundreds of years, evil thoughts and evil deeds have been committed within these walls. The house itself is evil now. Here they all are. Ashes. This is monstrous. It waits for me, because very soon I shall be dead. Oh, Madeline, come away with me now. You buried your own sister alive! I did. But she's dead now. The master hand of the macabre creates its masterpiece. The curse of the werewolf that was laid on a baby who grew into a man possessed by a monster. This Spanish town, the night brought drinking and dancing, music and girls, and the moon. The full moon that turned an innocent man into a savage beast. The Curse of the Werewolf. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Today we are talking about Beso Gogos, frequent cover artists for Famous Monsters of Filmland. Let's look at some stats and facts. Gogos paintings were featured on the covers of 52 famous monsters of Filmland from the classic Foray era. The first issue with a Gogos cover was number 9 with a portrait of Vincent Price from the House of Usher from 1960. 17 of his paintings were of universal monsters, followed by 7 giant monsters. 14 of the paintings were just of people, an actor in a role sometimes made up, other times not so much. His most popular subjects? Vincent Price had five appearances, followed closely by Lon Janey Sr. and Boris Karloff with four each. Most of his paintings were of single subjects, but he did have a handful with more than one character. Twice he had Frankenstein and his bride, and in another, profile portraits of Vincent Price, Peter Lorre, and Basil Rathbone together. FM 83 featured a scene from The Mummy's Tomb with three characters, One of my favorite covers is of Godzilla battling Mechagodzilla, FM-135. Most of the monsters and characters featured were male, but the few ladies shown were interesting. The first was the Bride of Frankenstein, who appeared three times on FM covers. In one of the more unusual paintings, we actually see a victim, in this case Gloria Stewart, startled by a hairy hand on her shoulder from The Old Dark House. 
A little girl was featured on issue 111, but she was far from ordinary, as she was possessed by a demon. It was Reagan, played by Linda Blair from The Exorcist. The Hammer Gorgon made an appearance, and the dead grandmother from the Golem inspired It was also painted by Gogos. Gogos painted most of the classic monsters, Frankenstein, werewolves, mummies, vampires, Mr. Hyde, King Kong, etc. But he had some rare and unusual ones as well, like the Colossal Beast, Gorgo, Fu Manchu, the hideous Sun Demon, Mr. Sardonicus, and to me the most obscure and rare creature in his next to last original painting for Classic FM, a picture of a mutant from the little seen or talked about mutations from 1974. Some of Gogo's early classics were repeated, some with psychedelic retouching. His Lon Chaney vampire from FM20 appeared on issue 69, recolorized like a rainbow. His hammer werewolf from FM12 showed up six times on FM51, each one a different color. These are two of several examples. Of course, the most repeated image was his painting of the Phantom of the Opera from FM16. Starting with issue 56, a black and white thumbnail version of this painting appeared on the left-hand corner of the cover together with the issue number. This lasted for 15 issues. Starting with issue 81, a full-colored version was used and remained the mascot for 82 subsequent issues. To end this segment, I have found a brief excerpt from an interview Basil Gogos did with the authors of the famous Monsters Chronicles, which I use as my index for the segments. This was from 1991 in the first edition. Can you leave us with any funny stories from your FM days? My favorite one is when I did the Gorgo cover. They used to print my name on the first page as the artist for the cover. The printer called Jim and asked, Is this Gorgo by Gogos or Gogos by Gorgo? How would you sum up your FM covers? The covers I did for FM were dreams. They were for people who wanted to dream, who loved to dream. I loved to dream and painting it for everybody. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. monster, a menacing giant, an awesome machine, unleashed with a deadly task. Godzilla, the only hope for Earth's survival. Godzilla versus the bionic monster. Godzilla strives to win supremacy in a fight to the end. Will Godzilla triumph? The Earth survive? Godzilla versus the bionic monster, an earth-shaking movie. Rated G. Relax. Get ready to have fun. Because you've got a date with somebody special. <laughs> You may think you are normal, but you are all the product of mutations. The Mutations. Rated R. Listeners, I am so excited for this one. This is something that I've never done on the show before. I've never had on as our main special guest one of the musicians whose music you've heard on the show. You heard him last week. You're going to hear some more music this week. You've already heard it at this point in the episode. I've got Chris Alexander from Frankie's Chop Shop on the show this week. Welcome to Monster Kid Radio. Thanks so much, Derek. This is super exciting for me. I love modern instrumental surf music. I'm just a huge fan. So when I reached out to you about having music on the show and you told me you already were aware of the show and all that, I was like, oh man, it's like, the full circle, everything's kind of coming around now. For sure. <laughs> what is Frankie's Chop Shop for people who don't know? It is music that I wrote mostly during the lockdown when my other two bands were dormant because of the lockdown and because of COVID and all that. I uh, had to do something. And watching Monsters episodes, I just kind of got inspired. And listening to your podcast, actually, too, gave me the idea to go the surf route. And was watching the monsters and tooling around on my guitar, and I came up with enough stuff to uh, make a few recordings, make an EP. And at first, I did some demos. I did uh, did them all by myself at home, and I played them for a couple friends. And they were nice enough to volunteer their skills and services in the studio with me. So we practiced for the summer, and we went into the studio and put it on out. And Frankie's Chop Shop, the name. Uh, one of my bands was a theatrical horror rock band called Murder Rock, and 
we all had different characters. I did the Frankenstein thing. I dressed up as Frankenstein. That was my character on stage. And my nickname, obviously, was Frankie. So right on the coattails of that project, I, I named it after Frankie's Chop Shop. And these guys were good musicians. They had chops. It just had a, a lot of different levels and layers to the name. Murder Rock, is that available online anywhere as well? It sure is. All the streaming services, yeah. So I'll look for that and make sure there's a link in the show notes so people can check that out as well. Oh, thanks. You know, we definitely, well, you know, we're monster kids. We want to support one another. And, you know, even if it's not surf music or or whatever, you're a monster kid. I want to support your stuff, you know? (laughs) Thank you so much. What is it? And I've I've asked people this before. Now that I've got an honest to goodness musician here on the show, I'm going to ask you. No pressure. I'm putting you on the spot. But what is it about surf music and monsters that goes so well together? That's so funny you asked that because I was going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to pose that. It's been on my mind as well. What What is it exactly? Exactly. I think it's as far as the, and I'd say cheesy in a good way, the, mm-hmm. as far as the old cheesy movies, uh, there's that sense of that aesthetic of lowbrow art. And I think the, the surf beat and the surf riffs are, kind of a, um, considered on the lowbrow end of rock and pop music in general. And it just seems like the sincere simplicity and that aesthetic of the melodies that, that some of the surf guitarists came up with certainly uh, led the creepy. You can It can get pretty creepy and, and spooky, such as the Munsters theme. Mm-hmm. It just seems to go together. It just seems to be like a blend well, like a good wine and a good cheese. So when I first heard your podcast, I thought, wow, I was, I was just thrilled to, to hear it all throughout the episode. You know, for those of you who do not drink vine, uh, we'll call it uh, chocolate and peanut butter. How about that? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think the Munsters, obviously, their theme song is very surfish and... Yeah, I, I've seen some research done that, and when I say research, I mean like a YouTube video somebody put out a while back, uh, talking about like the Beach Boys' use of the theremin and some of their stuff, and the theremin having sure. you know the day there's still soundtrack vibes and all of that, and maybe that kind of lent itself to that as well and started the trajectory. I don't know. I'm not a musician. Uh, I I don't play any musical instruments at all. Uh, if I could i would learn how to play guitar because i love surf it would be so much fun to learn how to play it <laughs> yeah but i don't need another hobby so i'm just gonna listen and support the bands that i love that way so <laughs> how long have you been playing music uh, i started guitar when i was like four years old and i wish i could say that i'm that good but it, it was kind of an on and off thing um i picked up a beatles book when i was about four i opened up and I saw the chord charts, and it really wasn't that hard to figure out, I thought. And I played the uh, first couple chords to the Yellow Submarine, and that was it. Just the first couple chords over and over. Drove everyone around me nuts, but uh, <laughs> that was my first foray into... And then uh, around early teenage years is when I, I was an old punk and metalhead, and I was into the horror thing. Even back then, I, I discovered I was liking the connection of horror and music. Mm-hmm. thrown together and I was always attracted to the visuals of, of uh, I've, I've since expanded my musical horizons beyond mm-hmm. <laughs> punk and metal since then but uh, but that's how I started out I've been playing so pretty much my whole life but just uh, on and off but I'm by no means as I sound like I've been playing since I was four <laughs> so did music come first then before the monsters around the same time around how I got into the monster kid thing was through the art of baseball go goes when I, I noticed I was my family was on vacation in Jamaica. I was around eight years old and we were in a liquor store, or a convenience store of some kind, and there was a copy of Famous Monsters of Filmland and I saw the Phantom of the Opera because they used that as in the corner of each issue mm-hmm. of the magazine they had that that portrait. And I was just attracted to it somehow for some reason. I just it, it attracted me. I recognized it from a puzzle that my grandmother had sent me for Christmas, just a, a random gift. I think she just put stuff in a cart and just sent it off to me and my three cousins, and I got the Phantom of the Opera puzzle, and it was that Basil Kogos illustration. I had no idea who it was, what it was, where it was from, or how, you know, how it related to a puzzle. I just thought it looked cool. I was like, well, that's a cool-looking face. And when I saw that magazine cover, I recognized it, 
And so I asked my mom to buy me the magazine. I bought the magazine. And that's when I went to the library and I got books out on, on all the classic car. And I started watching Dr. Shot's Theater, Shot Theater, which was the local horror host in Philadelphia. That's where I grew up at the time in Philadelphia. And started watching his show on, on weekends, on Saturday afternoons, and he showed all the classic Universal ones and all the, of course, Godzilla and, and, and Attack of the Puppet People, and <laughs> they seemed to play the same ones kind of over and over after three-month rotation. That's how I got into the Monster Kid thing, and I've kind of been a fan of the, of the Universal and the Hammer and the old 50s and 60s movies kind of ever since then. That's what kind of started my obsession with it. Listeners can't see this, but we're doing this via Zoom, and I can see he's wearing a Frankenstein T-shirt right now. And I can tell that Chris and I are going to be friends because he's got at least one cat wandering around the background every once in a while. So, you know, I'm a cat person, a monster kid. We're going to get along, I think. That's Spooky and Vivian. <laughs> spooky and Vivian. I love it. <laughs> and the shirt glows in the dark. There I you go. it after I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah, like I said, I, I'm a fan of the surf. I just, I don't know how to play it. The monsters have been with me so long, uh, you know, going back to the Crestwood House books and that sort of thing. So finding them in the public library, which I think yep. is how a lot of people, you know, of our age and all that have discovered a lot of this stuff. I never had a horror host. So whenever I hear people talk about horror hosts growing up, I get so jealous because I wish I did. Dr. Sock, he was friends with Zachary from New York City, <laughs> probably one of the more famous ones. And they were buddies, and he had gotten permission to use his image and costume under a different name. So he pretty much looked just like uh, the guy from New York City, except uh, he just called himself Dr. Shock and did all the all the, the kooky stuff in between the movies. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. He had his mad scientist laboratory. He had his daughter on. Uh, he would come out in a coffin. Uh, it was a blast. I, I love the old horror host I love all of them yeah I've gone back and watched a lot of the stuff now and I'm friends with so many of them you know the current crop of horror hosts and all that and I, I mm -hmm. love watching that stuff I, I've been building up Sven Gulli's episode on the DVR you know to, uh -huh. to have a little marathon with my wife at some point because it's just, <laughs> it's just fun it, it makes the movies they might be scary they might be fun you know to use the word cheesy as you said earlier adding the horror host just makes it even better yeah yeah Especially when they play surf music on their own show. Yeah. <laughs> Which a lot of them do, so. Yeah. You know? Uh, you know, I could sit here and geek out about how much I love what you do music-wise, but we, we have another topic to talk about. we got to talk about Basil Gogo. So the, the artist, the iconic artist behind so many famous Monsters of Filmland magazine covers, somebody that I know very little about. 50 of them he did. I tried to prepare for this. I've got booking the mail. Oh, the famous the monsters. Of Basil Gogo. Oh, yes. And is that the Phantom that you were talking about? That's actually a different one. There's another one that he did. This one. Okay. That's the one that yeah, I, the I, classic I had the puzzle Phantom. of. Yeah, that one. It's a great book. Famous monster movie art of Basil Gogo with a introduction by Rob Zombie. This is another field that I'm not very good at when it comes to like creating artwork, you know, painting, drawing, any of that stuff. I can draw if I spend a lot of time on it, but I couldn't do anything yeah. nearly at the level of like a Basil Gogos. But right. I know what I like, and I really like what he does. I love his use of color and light, and it makes the monsters seem to come alive in a way that I would imagine for people reading Famous Monsters back in the day when it was first hitting the shelves, they only saw the movies maybe once or twice, and when they did, they saw it in black and white. Black and white, yeah. And if he brings a sense of color and vibrant life to the uh, images that... Yeah. I don't want to see these black and white movies colorized, but you know, I'll look at a Basil Gogo's painting and you know thrill at his use of yellows and reds and oranges to make those, those characters yes. pop. Multiple light sources was his technique was imagine another one and he liked doing them uh the monsters because he had creative freedom with it he started out doing western western paperback books before oh, wow. foreign publications hired him to do the famous monsters and he took to it because he enjoyed the freedom it gave him to they gave him a pretty loose leash to uh create his own vision of what these monsters looked like he wanted to make them look scary and sympathetic at the same time. 
I think I think I see that in a lot of the art. Every episode of Monster Kid Radio has Kenny's look at famous monsters of film land, and listeners yeah. would have heard it by now. Uh, Kenny did go through uh, some of Gogus's career when it comes to famous monsters in his segment, and he talked about some of the different monsters that he did. Do you have a favorite one or two covers that he did? Well, obviously, the Phantom of the Opera one that was the puzzle that was my Christmas gift. Uh, the Bride of Frankenstein, he did a couple times. Uh, pretty much that, that Phantom of the Opera one with the purple background is, is the one that uh, I would have to say is my favorite just because it holds... I took that puzzle apart and put it back together so many times <laughs> that uh, that's how I, that one will always hold hold dear in my heart for me. That Basil Gogo's book is one that I do not have, but it's starting to sound like I need to have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't read it all the way through yet, but it, I would think you would enjoy it for sure. For sure. I, I love his Gorgo cover, which I find unique because so many of the monsters that he painted are, are humanoid, right? Yeah. You know, Frankenstein's monster or the Phantom or any of those. But Gorgo is, well, he's a kaiju. He doesn't look anything like a man, but I love his Gorgo cover. Uh-huh. It's one of my it's one of my absolute favorites, and I know they would reuse, as Kenny mentioned earlier, a lot of his artwork. Yes, they would maybe color it a little differently, and I don't know if Gogos recolored his own work or somebody at Warren Publishing did or not. Do you know? I do not, but he also did work for some of their other publications, some of the Erie Magazine. Oh, okay, and. A couple of the other ones that they had, the Western magazine, he did, but his, uh, apparently his favorite was the monsters because of the freedom that he gave him. Can you blame him? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what am I going to work on a Western? And I, and I love Westerns, don't get me wrong, but yeah. if I get a chance to do something with the Phantom of the Opera or Gorgo, I'm going to jump at it. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Did he do a lot of book covers, do you know, other than... He started out doing book covers, pulp covers okay. in the fifties. Uh, like I said, the westerns and also pinup type women, beautiful pinup type girls. Okay, and, and didn't say exactly how he was hired or noticed by uh, Forrest Backman and the other gentlemen that ran Warren Publications. But obviously, once he was hired, he he was the main source of their uh, artwork. He did it all through the 50s, 60s, and in the 70s, he wanted to become more of a fine artist on his own right. Walked away from it for a bit in the 70s, and that's probably when they recycled his work from the 50s and 60s. And then in the 90s, he came back and did covers for a Monster Scene magazine, which I'd never heard of. Okay. And not up until his death. I don't even know if they're still printing famous monsters of felt land in print. I, I have it. I look at it on oh, my iPad. <laughs> I haven't seen it on the magazine rack. I know that every once in a while it does turn back up. I'm not sure what the status is of it now. Kind of sporadic, yeah. Yeah. Monster Scene magazine, I have seen issues of over the years. I, I don't own any. Uh, in fact, I don't own any issues of famous monsters. It, I wish I did. I don't know what happened to mine. I had a I had a pretty good collection when I was a kid, and who knows what happened to them. <laughs> yeah, and I know that when they came back, when Famous Monsters came back, uh, they did have like a variant cover by Gogos of Dracula, which is totally cool. I mean, very cool. Uh, I think IDW printed that issue, and they used uh, instead of the Phantom, they used uh, Count Orlock. Okay. The upper left hand corner. Yeah. I don't I'm not sure who drew or who illustrated that Count Orlock, but uh that was several years ago at this point, uh, what two thousand ten, I believe. So do you you said you read it on the iPad now. Do you own any physical copies of Famous Monsters, he says? I tracked one down with the Phantom on the cover that I bought from nice. a, a fellow musician. He had his collection, he had he had been selling. Uh, the other ones, like I said, I, I had them stacked up when I was a kid. Maybe my mother knows. I, I highly doubt she's, <laughs> she's still in possession of them in the attic or something. Who knows? Along with all my old kids posters. Who knows? <laughs> all the <laughs> all stuff from the being a, uh, being a kid in the 70s. It was a great time to be a kid. Yeah. Got to see Star Wars when it first came out in the theaters. And Jaws, and The Thing, and Shiny. I saw all those movies. 
uh, when they first came out in the theater. So man, I'm still so so jealous, man. I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated movies as a kid, so I didn't get to see a lot of that stuff. So, uh, but I was there for Star Wars. You mentioned Star Wars, and I think yeah. Gogos even did a Star Wars cover or two, didn't he? I think I've seen a Gogos um, sand person. I'm not sure what it was for though. Oh, okay. In learning more about the man and his artwork, what are some interesting things that you've learned about him? It's always nice to see someone who, when they have that old saying that uh, "do what you love for your work," uh, he probably enjoyed doing his work. I mean, I don't enjoy my job. <laughs> he, he got to have one of those jobs where he, he, you know, he found it, he found his flag and he waved it for a long time there and it became iconic. And he certainly has a, had an influence on modern artists. There's a lot of, uh, I don't mention them by name, but there's a lot of illustrators and artists out there that, that do exactly what he did. And pretty much like they, uh, come on, can't you find your own vision? <laughs> oh no! And, and there's some other artists out there that you can tell he had a, a good influence on, or a big influence on, and they done their own, put their own twist on on what he's done. But he <laughs> certainly had a huge, uh, huge influence on the art world, the pop art world. For sure, I'm a huge fan of uh, Daniel Horn's work. And- uh huh. His use of lighting and light source and color. Exactly. I, I can see some go go in there. I don't know if yeah. it's intentional. I've never talked to him about it. Right. Uh, but I'd like to at some point. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I feel like some of his artwork he uses Absolutely. Uh, light in a way that's very go Is that a word? It uh-huh. is not. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, Doug Pagash. He's also. Uh, I don't know if I'm familiar with his work. The similar vein. He Similar vein is Daniel Horn. Uh, and my favorite modern artist, as far as the horror thing, is Mike Bell. Um, uh, who mm-hmm. does he puts his whole thing is to put the monsters, the Universal monsters, and other uh, iconic movie characters in unlikely spots. So often he'll put like Dracula and Frankenstein in a tiki bar, and they're wearing the little Fez hats and they're having cocktails, <laughs> martinis in their hands, and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Uh, he does things like that. He'll put Frankenstein on a motorcycle, give him a bunch of tattoos and <laughs> things like that. And, and uh, you can tell he's influenced by, by probably learned a thing or two from, from Go-Go's, but he definitely has his own, uh, developed into his own style for sure too. I think he's the one who's done the Bride of Frankenstein in the Rosie the Riveter pose. Yes. If I remember right, so. Sounds about right, yeah. Which I love. I'd love to get a print of that. And if you go on to his website, Bell Dog Studios is his website. If you log on to that, you'll hear surf. Oh, music. really? <laughs> See, Coming again, it's speakers. all connected, yeah. right? I hadn't thought about, and I want to be clear. You, I think you used the phrase or the descriptor lowbrow earlier. Yeah. When we say that, we're not judging. There, I know it sounds like it could be a negative term, and it's not. It's just a style of, of art and music, uh, crafting all of that cars, you know, design even, um, yeah. you know, I just popped over to belldogstudio.com and yeah, I can see so much of his artwork yeah. on there now having that kind of low brown aesthetic. And I, I love that yeah. man. Oh, so good. Okay, I don't want to turn this into a thing where I'm just kind of sitting around <laughs> looking at cool artwork with somebody on a podcast. I don't know how fun that would be. <laughs> but, okay, so Mike Bell, Daniel Horn, uh, who are some of your other uh, artists that you look at when it comes to monster art? And you say, that that guy's got it. Oh, I mentioned uh, Doug P. Gosh. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's P apostrophe Gosh, like God. <laughs> uh, and so a lot of them, I, I discover a lot of them on Instagram. Uh, Daniel Horn, I'm familiar with as well. I know he's listened to the show before, but Mark Maddox is also very, very good. Uh huh. And again, it's that throwback retro style. Everything from the monster illustrations to puzzles to model kits, to even Halloween decorations. That style just evokes something in me as a monster kid. Yeah, throwing aesthetic. It's charming. I find it charming. It really is. That, that kind of weirdo kind of aesthetic. There's just something about it. I and mean, even that one episode of Leave it to Beaver where they're wearing the monster sweatshirts. You know, that, that, that style. <laughs> I would see I mean, that one. Oh, it's so great. You know, they get in trouble for wearing monster sweatshirts to school, but the sweatshirts <laughs> have these 
these horrible looking illustrations of monsters on them. Like that's that's totally what I would wear to work. What are you talking about? That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm all in. You know, so yeah. that that aesthetic. And if any time I stumble across, you know, especially this season, that kind of retro aesthetic for Halloween decorations or, or film or, or artwork. Yes. It seems to be a lot more available this time of year for us. Yes. And you're down there in like the Nevada area? Reno. Yes, sir. What is the monster scene like down there? I have a small circle of friends who are into the same things I am. <laughs> when Murder Rock was active, not a lot of people understood the concept as a whole. There were horror fans, there were music fans, but it was hard to get them in the same room and really understand what we were trying to present, which was kind of a third-rate Alice Cooper. <laughs> we tried our hardest to uh, uh, we tried our hardest to put on a theatrical show, and each each of our songs were about a different horror movie. The main songwriter was really the Lucio Fulci, so a oh, lot wow. of Italian a lot of Italian horror it was influenced in each song. But we also did a whole album on all Stephen King stories, oh. which was fun to do. And there is a horror group on Facebook page for Reno here, but there's not much of a a big scene for it. Okay. However, in Sacramento, just a couple hours to the west, there's a huge scene there. They have a film festival and a creature con every year. They have two film festivals, one of the Love Horror Film Festival in the summer and then the Sacramento Horror Film Festival uh, during this time of the year. And I've been to several of them, and I see the same people there. I've made a, a few friends, and, and I see the same people show up there, and then it's, for some reason or another, it's I'm jealous. <laughs> I wish we had it. as much of a scene here in Reno as they do over there. It's very well organized, very well supported, and it's, it's, it's fun. So I kind of ride the coattails of the Sacramento scene out there as far as uh, seeing new independent and, and the, the creature con that they put on just have some amazing artwork, mm-hmm. artists, makeup artists and, and visual artists as well. So I love going to the cons and looking at all, meeting all the different artists. So you've mentioned Murder Rock more than once and I said I was going to put a link in the show notes, but wh- where is that online? Is it on Bandcamp as well or is there somewhere else I should send people? We disbanded and we broke up that project and I think the website went to the wayside. <laughs> I'm okay. not sure the website's still active, but anything on Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube, there's even a couple of videos on YouTube. Oh, okay. Pretty easy to find. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure people can track it down uh, and thank see you. it. Is Murder Rock one word or two words or what all one word. Okay. Yeah. So like the movie title? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Which, ironically, we didn't write one about the Bat movie, but, <laughs> but uh, just about all the other faulty ones we've got it covered. Right on. Okay. Well, we'll look for that. But obviously, you know, we're, we're really into the surf thing here. So with Frankie's Chop Shop dot com is how I found you, but it's on Facebook as well. Do you ever do any live music these days? I'm in two different bands now. One of them I just just uh, did my last show with, and uh, I've grown into a blues mode right now to oh, do wow. a pure blues so i've got a, a pure blues project going on that i'm focusing on um there is a a, a a kind of a glam horror band called glitter bats that grew out of the ashes of murder rock and i just recently sidestepped out of there just to focus on my my blues project and even that project i think is going to be influenced a lot by a lot of the, the, the classic car aesthetic and stuff like that. Let's so say you can't get away from the monsters, man. No. <laughs> it sounds like it's a big part of who you are. You know, going back to what you say, four years old? I mean, come on. Yeah, sure is. Thanks to Dr. Shock. <laughs> Dr. Shock, famous monsters, all of that. You know, it. Yeah. I, I love hearing about the orca story of various monster kids, especially monster kids that are still continuing to create and representing their love for this. And, and I've talked about this over the years on the show that I can't think of any subgenre of film or media really that seems to have so many people so invested in creating their own artwork uh, and representing their origin so clearly and loudly. You, you don't see, yes. you know, dirty dancing fan films. You don't see, you know, 
Ace Ventura no. film conventions, but you do see Monster Bash and you do see people wanting to dress up as Frankenstein every year and you do see oh, Monster yeah. Magazines all the time and you definitely see Basil Gogos. And, you know, I, I I want to thank you for spending some time with me to talk about Basil. Is there anything else you want to mention about Basil before we wrap up? Well, I would recommend this book for sure to all the listeners. I, I know for sure would enjoy it. He not only covered the Universal Monsters Love, but the Hammer uh, catalog as well. So he did a lot of, and he did a lot of the portraits of the actors, not just the monsters, Vincent Price, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, and of course, Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. And I uh, wanted to mention to you that you've had Sarah Karloff on your show. Yes. And mm-hmm. I'm friends with her. She has, she has a house up here in Lake Tahoe. Oh. I've been to her house uh, for dinner and been out to dinner with her a couple or a few times, so I'll be sure to say hello to her for you. I met her cool. at a convention and uh, just figured out we lived in. She's such a sweet, nice lady. She just oh, she really is. Ex- extended out her hand and said, "Hey, come, come, let's have dinner sometime." Since you live so close, uh, I named my dog after Boris. <laughs> I mean, that is, and that's what she just absolutely loved that. And that's what kind of sparked our friendship. That's fantastic. She really is sweet. I haven't talked to her in a few years now, but uh, having her on the show was definitely a thrill and meeting yeah, her in person. I listened uh, to that episode. Was such a wow that wow. <laughs> I never imagined story. that would have happened. Yeah. 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 Some story. <laughs> yeah, and she really is a sweet star. So yeah, please tell her I said hello. It's, it's been a while. I'll show sure. her an email here in a few weeks, or maybe wish her a happy Halloween or something. So. Yeah. Uh, but that's super cool. Right on, man. All right. Last question for you. What are you doing to celebrate Halloween? So we're at the school night. Well, I've got my pumpkins outside. Uh, I live in a neighborhood that doesn't get a lot of foot traffic for, for candy. So I might uh, have a few friends that have kids that they want to go trick-or-treating. I'll probably tag along with them and go to the neighborhoods that are decorated and a little more foot traffic and probably just take a few friends and their kids trick-or-treating by car, you know, drop them off at the corner and walk walk around with them. Uh, I won't trick-or-treat myself, but I'll <laughs> certainly <laughs> enjoy watching them, yeah. You dress up? I might just probably just dress up in my own standard Frankenstein costume since I have all the, the neck bolts and I've got the makeup. I, I didn't let go of any of it. <laughs> Fantastic. That's awesome. Well, if I don't talk to you again before, and I'm sure we will, but I got to say happy Halloween to a fellow monster kid and a fellow surf aficionado. Happy Halloween. For years, I have searched for a unique way whereby a motion picture audience can actually decide the climax of a picture. I have found such a way. My latest picture... Mr. Sodonicus offers something no audience has ever had before. The power to determine the fate of a character on the screen. The power to punish. In ancient Rome, spectators could decree life or death to a gladiator by indicating thumbs up or thumbs down. During the French Revolution, the mobs could condemn a man by merely shouting to the guillotine. In the early West, Vigilantes took the law into their own hands. Today, for the first time, the awful power to punish will be yours. After you see the evil events that made Mr. Sodonicus what he was, you will decide what should be done to him. You will now see some scenes from the picture. The face of Mr. Sodonicus will not be shown. Because I realize that some people in this audience might be adversely affected by it. Those of you who come to see Mr. Sodonicus will understand why. Mr. Sodonicus. What makes his name strike terror? Sardonicus. Why were you frightened? Uh, Sir, you would not understand. You are young. You do not yet have daughters. 
Why does his wife live in abject fear? If you do not heal him, he will punish me. Surely he wouldn't beat you. His cleverness knows a more hideous torture. What strange attraction did young women have for him? What secrets are hidden behind his doors? Mr. Sardonicus. His deeds formed a fabric of nightmares. His face, the face of Sardonicus, can be described only in the eyes of its beholders. Mr. Sardonicus, in spite of all his cruelties, some people will think he deserves mercy. Others will feel that no punishment could be too severe. When you come to see Mr. Sardonicus, you will receive a, a ballad like this. At a certain point in the picture, you will vote thumbs up or thumbs down. His punishment will depend on the result of your vote. Thank you to Mark. Thank you to Kenny. Thanks to Chris for being part of this week's episode of the podcast. And thank you, well, you. For listening and downloading and hopefully retweeting tweets, sharing posts, and just spreading the Monster Kid love across the internet, letting people know about what we do here and the kind of fun we have on Monster Kid Radio. I love talking monsters with people. And to have kind of a free-form conversation with a fellow creative was just a lot of fun, man. Just a lot of fun. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you are interested in Frankie's Chop Shop or Murder Rock or anything that we've talked about here on the show, that book that Chris mentioned about Basil Gogos, head over to monsterkidradio.net. There's going to be links to everything we've talked about here on the show in the show notes over there. You're also going to find Amazon affiliate links to, well, Amazon, if you need to get your hands on Return of Ultraman or that Basil Gogos book, which is co-edited by Carrie Gamble, somebody else who's been on the show and an artist that I can't believe that Chris and I didn't bring up is also being one of the go-to monster artists of our age. Oops. Um, sorry, Carrie. Anyway, if you want to pick up the book for yourself, please consider using that Amazon affiliate link because every time you buy something through the Amazon affiliate link, we get like two pennies off the top and every little bit helps, especially when things like this month's Patreon payment help put gas in my car. That's another way you can support Monster Kid Radio is through Patreon. You can also check out, well, Patreon as well as Discord, Reddit, our Facebook page, our Facebook group, and our Twitter, or X, I guess is now it's called, over on our website there as well. You can also find our contact information if you want to call in and tell me about some other artists that I might have missed or just comment on anything we've talked about here on the show. Give us a call, 360 360- 524-2484 or email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com I know last week that I was it last week? I think it might have been last week time is a flat circle. Anyway I know in a previous episode I mentioned that I did receive some feedback that our YouTube channel is a little wonky. You're going to get the new episodes that's fine but once you start going into the back catalog of Monster Kid Radio you might find one or two episodes that are labeled incorrectly for some reason or other you also are going to find things kind of out of order, and you're not going to find the really early episodes. I'm still working on getting a lot of that resolved, so please bear with me on that. If you are a YouTube user, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel over there, and please check out our Team Death YouTube channel. Team Death, that's team, and then death is D-E-T-H. That's where Beth and I hang out on YouTube, and I bring it up because we're going to be posting some YouTube videos here very soon of our experiences, our journey through various haunt attractions in the area. We just went to the Davis Graveyard, and we're going to be posting a YouTube video about that experience in the next few days. So make sure you head over there to the YouTube channel and subscribe to it. Again, link in the show notes to that as well. Link in the show notes too to Torch Song Entertainment's Sinister Songs and Terrifying Tales. Their event, their show was coming up this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you can buy tickets over at TorchSongEntertainment.com slash cabarets, or just go straight to TorchSongEntertainment.com and follow the links there. Again, link in the show notes. Also, big thanks to Steve Sullivan, and please consider picking up a number of his books. They make perfect reading 
during the uh, Halloween season, especially his Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors. Pick that up. Read it. It's got an awesome cover by the aforementioned Mark Maddox. It's a book for monster lovers. You're a monster lover. You're going to love the book. So go check that out. Steve, thanks for being a sponsor of this week's episode. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of Monster Kid Radio or get in on some of that advertising, drop me a line at monsterkidradio at gmail.com and we'll talk advertising. I'll send you a rate sheet and we'll figure something out. What's coming up next week on the show? Well, I'm not 100% sure, but I know we're going to talk about what's coming up at the Joy Cinema. I am stoked, ladies and gentlemen. I have not been to the Joy Cinema for Scarathon in several years, partly because there wasn't one during the pandemic, and then partly because I've just been so busy. And as mentioned in a previous kind of mini episode, I'm no longer busy at a particular haunt attraction anymore, so I'm going to be free that weekend. I'm going to Scarathon. Scarathon is happening on October 28th. It's a Saturday. You can buy all-day passes soon. Five movies starting at noon. Robot Monster in 3D. 1.30, Tarantula. 3 p.m., Hammers the Mummy. 4.30, and I am stoked about this. I'm going to put Jeff on blast here in a second. The Monster Squad. And at 6 p.m., it's Trick or Treat. And I believe it's the 2000. 6 or 2007 Trick or Treat, the anthology film, as opposed to the movie that has... Is it Ozzy Osbourne in it? Yeah, I think it's a more recent film. I am super excited about the Monster Squad showing on the big screen at the Joy Cinema. Jeff, I love you, man. Jeff Punkrock Martin puts on a great show, but he's not a big fan of the Monster Squad, and every year when he talks about Scarathon and people mention the Monster Squad, he kind of drags his heels and talks about putting something else up. And don't get me wrong, he puts up a great show. He puts on an incredible show. But dude, the Monster Squad, on the big screen, in a classic movie theater like The Joy, it's going to be so cool. And I'm in talks with him now to be there to help host and introduce movies. Don't know if we're going to have a full-on table set up or anything like that. I hope so. We did that once before, and it was so much fun, and I got to meet so many incredible people. I hope we can do that again. I know we're going to talk about Scarathon next week on the show. I just don't know in what capacity. But in the meantime, head over to thejoycinema.com and you're going to be able to find out how you can buy tickets to get to that event here soon. He's going to have merch. He's got some of the best popcorn around. And it's one of my favorite theaters. We loved it so much we got married in it. Beth and I, that is. Why did I feel the need to say that? Of course, Beth and I, you know. Anyway, that is kind of what's coming up next week. Potentially. So stay tuned to monsterkidradio.net or specifically on Facebook. Follow us because we're going to announce there once we figure out exactly what we're doing next week. And then Nosferatu November is coming up. And I can tell you that I've got Dominique Lamsey's booked to talk about Blackula. That'll be happening here uh, in November. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be fun. And I've mentioned the dinosaurs in Dinosember or December. Man, we just got some really cool stuff coming up here on Monster Kid Radio. I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. Stay tuned so that you can find out what happens next. Until next week, please stay tuned. And remember, the Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song The Bat. That is copyright 2021, Frankie's Chop Shop. Again, thank you, Chris, for letting us play the music of Frankie's Chop Shop here on the show. Check out the self-titled album, Frankie's Chop Shop, at frankieschopshop.bandcamp.com or follow the link in the show notes or find them on Facebook. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week. Ciao. I'm Vincent Price. Come closer. You'll be just as safe in this 